Hospital, Ortho Express in Norwalk. Don't wait hours in the ER. Save a trip and money by going straight to an orthopedic specialist at Coastal Ortho Express Urgent Care in Norwalk. No appointment necessary. Coastal Ortho Express Urgent Care, 203-845-2070. Open Monday through Saturday in the I Park Building at 761 Main Avenue in Norwalk or call 203-845-2070. Fast. The long winter is finally astern. Bait is invading the harbors, coves, and inlets. Stripers, fluke, and porgies are on the move. In the streams and lakes, trout, smallmouth, largemouth, and walleye have moved out of hibernation. At the dock shop, it's all systems go. And now in two locations, 51 Tokenique Road, Darien, and their newest location at 609 Riverside Avenue in Westport. Bait, tackle, apparel, and of course, all the marine and nautical accessories that they're known for are ready for you at the dock shop. Boater, beach bum, fisherman, or simply love the New England coast, this is a unique place to shop. The dock shop, 51 Tokenique Road, Darien, 609 Riverside Avenue, Westport. Visit us at dockshop.com. Hersam Acorn and HANradio.com. Welcome back to the ballpark at Harbor Yard. This is Coffee Break presented by Stratford Orthodontics on HANradio.com. Streaming now on the Hersam Acorn Network, John Kovach with Kate Chaplinski. Alex Hager will be joining us. Eric Gendron on the video. Josh Fisher on the audio. number of guys I'll recognize later behind the scenes helping us out. Just to bring you back up to speed. We're here for day two. We came here yesterday anticipating a baseball doubleheader. We got one game. Then they put the tarp on the field. Actually, the Staples players did. It was kind of an amusing scene. Hopefully, you could roll some video of that later. Uh, they saw some lightning. It was very threatening. Half the sky was light, Kate. Half of it dark. It really split right over the stadium. They never started game two. They postponed it till 5 o'clock this afternoon. Shortly after we arrived here to do coffee break this morning, we learned that given the significant threat of showers and thunderstorms this afternoon, the second semifinal in the FCAC baseball tournament has again been postponed. So here is how this is going to shake out. We are going to do coffee break from here. Stir Crazy will come to you audio only from our Ridgefield office. And then we'll do Yankee Fisherman live here at the ballpark at Harbor Yard. Tomorrow, we will bring you the second half of the FCAC baseball semifinal doubleheader. That now a 4 p.m. start. The winner of that game will face Wilton at 7.30 in the FCAC championship. And those two games will be the cap on a full day of broadcasting, Kate. We'll do coffee break again. And we cannot thank the Bridgeport Bluefish enough for their hospitality. They've been absolutely great to us letting us set up here do our shows from here. It's They've been awesome. They've come on the show. It's been a great time being here. There's worse places for me to oh, come yeah. to work than a ballpark. So tomorrow we'll have coffee break at 11. We'll have behind the news at noon. And Radio Arts and Leisure at 1. And then we'll have the games in the afternoon. Great. All right, John, thanks. Well, we have a lot of news to get to today, including a serious car accident in Fairfield involving some high school students and a surprising announcement made by Shelton School Superintendent Freeman Burr. We're going to get to that as well as look at the front pages of all of our Hersom Acorn newspapers that are out on newsstands today in our towns that we cover. But, John, I mean, you mentioned weather affecting today's games, but what else is going on out there? Well, Initial forecasts were for scattered showers and thunderstorms mainly before 9 this morning. That's now passed. And we're talking mostly sunny now for the afternoon. But the temperature is going to drop to around 60 by 5 p.m. Southwest winds 5 to 7 miles an hour. And then it calms. 30% chance of precipitation. Then tonight, mostly clear, temperature rising to about 77 by 3 a.m. So you've got a front moving through. The National Weather Service has issued a hazardous weather outlook for southern Connecticut, northeastern New Jersey, and southeast New York. 
calling for the possibility of severe thunderstorms this afternoon and this evening as that cold front passes through. These will feature gusty winds, hail, lightning strikes, locally heavy rainfall, and that is why they didn't want to open the ballpark and let people be in here and be exposed. Better to, to postpone it and try again tomorrow when the forecast is a little bit better. Take a look at the roads, Kate. We have road work in Derby on Route 8 South at exit 15. That is Route 34. Road work in Greenwich on the Merritt Parkway South at exit 28. That is Round Hill Road. We also have earlier delays cleared in Westport, and we have delays in Stamford as is common. A lot of the earlier delays have reportedly cleared. Great. All right. Thanks, John. We'll get into some of the news this morning. For the second time in less than two months, someone has been struck and killed by a train in Fairfield. On Wednesday afternoon, officials said a man stepped onto the tracks of an oncoming Metro North train and lay down. He was struck and killed just east of Fairfield Metro Station. The train's engineer told Fairfield police that he spotted the man standing alongside the tracks near one of the auto dealer warehouses off Commerce Drive. The train was unable to stop and rolled over the man. Emergency crews were responded to the area of 450 Schofield Avenue. Police did not have an imme immediate identification of the victim. The investigation was turned over to Metro North Police, who said they did not have any further information on the incident this morning. The train that ran over the man left Grand Central Terminal in New York City at 2.04 p.m. and was due in New Haven at 4.06, according to the Metro North spokesman Marjorie Anders. All four tracks of the rail line were shut down Wednesday while the Fairfield Fire Department worked at the scene. The tracks reopened shortly before 5 o'clock with some delays. By 8 o'clock last night, full s service had been restored, and we'll bring you any updates on that story. John, what else is going on? Okay, continuing what was really an awful afternoon in Fairfield yesterday. Actually, started in the morning. Two teens were injured, one seriously. When the car they were in crashed on Knapps Highway near Fairfield Ward High School, according to police, the vehicle pulled out of the parking lot at a high rate of speed. The driver lost control, and the Jeep Wrangler slammed sideways into a utility pole, snapping the pole, striking at passenger side first. The passenger was more seriously injured, and according to reports, has been transferred to Yale New Haven Hospital after that accident yesterday morning. And then yesterday afternoon, shortly after the train incident you just talked about, multiple pedestrians were struck by a vehicle in a parking lot near the Dunkin' Donuts and Coles on uh, Tunxis Hill. Oh, all right, thanks, John. Well, Shelton School Superintendent Freeman Burr unexpectedly announced Wednesday night that he would resign as school superintendent at the end of the calendar year. Burr said a frustrating budget process in Shelton was the main reason for his decision, with the Board of Education receiving only 40% of its requested budget increase requests during the past five years. Specifically, he said the Board of Ed has asked for a total of $12.6 million in increases during the past five budget cycles and only received received $4.8 million. He said during the same time period, the city's fund balance has continued to grow. Burr said, clearly the city has fared better than our students, as well as our teachers. And he said that at the May 27th Board of Ed meeting, that was last night. He described this year's budget as being exceedingly frustrating. He said much planning went into the school system's budget proposal with a requested increase that will surely be trimmed significantly by the time the 2015-16 budget is finalized tonight. He said, given the wealth of this town, the budget process should not be this difficult. Deep down, he said, I loathe the idea of having to go through another budget process in Shelton. Burr has expressed frustration as the lack of meetings with Mayor Mark Loretti and aldermanic leaders on the budget this year. Mayor Loretti is not reacting well to Freeman Burr's statements that he's leaving due to budget frustration. In fact, Loretti told the Shelton Herald, it's disappointing he would say that. I'd characterize it as unfair and a cop-out. This is nonsense. So really interesting story out of Shelton. Brad Drell's doing a great job covering it at SheltonHerald.com. I used to be Shelton Herald editor, and I worked with Freeman Burr and found him to be a really, you know, strong leader for the school. And, you know, he had a pretty solid relationship with Mark Loretti at the time that I was there. I know there had been some past issues between them, and then they had kind of come to an understanding and wanting to work together. Um, 
really interesting. Budget processes are incredibly draining. They're long, they're time consuming, there's a lot of back and forth. Could this just be him making a statement out of frustration? Or do you really think he's reached a point where he's had it? I think he's reached a point where he's had it. I mean, covering the budgets in Shelton, they are tough. I mean, you know, they don't like to give that much to the schools. They're very conservative. And a lot of people live in Shelton because the taxes are so low. And it is, you know, a nice community. And as Freeman Burr has pointed out in our past meetings, you know, Shelton schools do far better than, you know, any other uh, school system in the Valley. But they do it with a lot less. And I think that he's probably frustrated with doing so much with a lot less. So, I mean, it was a big fight to get full-day kindergarten last right. year. Huge fight. And they were one of the few districts in the state that still didn't have it. So, I mean, you know, I bet a lot of people that really don't want to see their taxes go up appreciate Mark Loretti and the Board of Aldermen being so tough. But, you know, a lot of the school supporters get frustrated. How long has he been there? Freeman Burr? Yes. Um, I would say, I believe, five or six years. Okay. Yeah. So not that long. Not that long. But I could see it grinding. Uh, news just in from the Milford Meerkate. Milford police arrested a Bridgeport man on a warrant yesterday, charging him with allegedly exposing himself to a woman who was jogging on May 17th. 23-year-old Scott Lynch of Greystone Road in Bridgeport is accused of exposing his genitals to a female jogger on Bridgeport Avenue in Milford near Cleveland Street. Police said Lynch approached the woman as she was jogging. With help from Stratford police, detectives identified Lynch as a suspect, and a warrant was issued for his arrest. He's been charged with breach of peace and public indecency. Bond was $2,500 for court June 23rd. I wonder if he's connected to those incidents we had happening in Stratford on Main Street. That's what I'm wondering. It's sounding like that might be the, a connection there. They never found that person who had, no. had exposed himself to some women Keep there. Keep an eye on that situation at the Milford Mirror and the Stratford Star. All right. Thanks, John. Well, a zoning official for the town of East Haven has been arrested on federal charges, alleging that he extorted money during a home inspection. 40-year-old Frank Binnaker Jr. was arrested Wednesday at his home in West Haven. He appeared in federal court in New Haven and was released on a $20,000 bond. Federal prosecutors said Binnaker told one victim he had to inspect an addition to the home and would make the person tear it down unless he received a $200 payment. Hmm. Authorities say the victim told the FBI that Biancur had been extorting them since October 2012. He has now been charged with theft of honest services, mail fraud, and could face a maximum prison term of 20 years if convicted. Coffee break time is 11.27. Well, Kate taking another look at the weather. Clouding up a little bit here. We've got scattered showers and thunderstorms forecast for later today mostly sunny it's steamy temperature is supposed to plummet this afternoon as that front moves through there are warnings about severe thunderstorms with hail high winds lightning locally heavy rain that is why the baseball game that we were here to cover that was postponed last night has again been postponed alex hager will bring you all that in sports in a couple of minutes taking a look at the roads just the road work we have in Derby at exit 15 and a road work in Greenwich on the Merritt Parkway South at exit 28. All right. Thanks, John. Well, take a break. Take a break. Come back with history, sports, more news. Sounds good. All right. Well, that's what we're going to do, and we'll be back right after this. Your child has fallen and broken his arm. You need to see an orthopedist fast. Think Coastal Ortho Express in Norwalk. Don't wait hours in the ER. Save a trip and money by going straight to an orthopedic specialist at Coastal Ortho Express Urgent Care in Norwalk. No appointment necessary. Coastal Ortho Express Urgent Care, 203-845-2070. Open Monday through Saturday in the I Park Building at 761 Main Avenue in Norwalk or call 203-845-2070. Fast. The long winter is finally astern. Bait is invading the harbors, coves, and inlets. Stripers, fluke, and porgies are on the move. In the streams and lakes, trout, smallmouth, largemouth, and walleye have moved out of hibernation. At the dock shop, it's all systems go. And now in two locations, 51 Tokenique Road, Darien, and their newest location at 609 Riverside Avenue in Westport. Bait, tackle, apparel, and of course, all the marine and nautical accessories that they're known for are ready for you at the dock shop. Boater, beach bum, 
fishermen or simply love the New England coast, this is a unique place to shop. The Dock Shop, 51 Tokenique Road, Darien, 609 Riverside Avenue, Westport. Visit us at DocShop.com. Hersam Acorn and HANRadio.com. Welcome back to your coffee break presented by Stratford Orthodontics on HANRadio.com. John Kovach with Kate Chaplinski here at the ballpark at Harbor Yard. Alex Hager joining us. Alex did the color as Rob Adams did the play-by-play last night as Wilton upset Darien in game one. And the wait for game two is going to be another 30 hours. That was a heck of a ball game last night. We had a lot of fun, and uh, unfortunately, we don't get to see some more baseball for another day. No. So, tough one last night for Darien, where they had opportunities and kind of ran themselves out of a couple of them. They did. It was a game that Wilton really deserved to win with the way that they played, and it was a game that just did not fall in Darien's favor. As it was a case of too little, too late. They really just couldn't get their bat on the ball until pretty late in the ball game, and Wilton had the early edge. And one thing that did fall in Wilton's favor was that mile-high pop-up that hit the ground not far from home plate after two Darien defenders collided. Yeah, it was an unfortunate error for the Blue Wave, and it really sealed the deal for Wilton's victory, putting up two more runs uh, in the sixth inning on a sky-high foul ball. Excuse me, not a foul ball, but a pop fly that was right near the plate. And, it wasn't, uh, and it wasn't fair by much. It was fair by only about two feet. And the catcher, the pitcher, and the third baseman all tried to get it, and they were all trying to dodge the runner at the same time. And in the end, it fell in, and Wilton scored two runs. What else have we got in the sports world? Well, it's been a very busy week in sports here in Fairfield County and in the state of Connecticut, and it's been, a, and it's been an, expe- an especially busy few days as we are in FCAC and SEAC championship season. So like we talked about, Wilton beat Darien 5-1 to one in the FCAC baseball semifinal last night. We were looking forward to Trinity versus Staples tonight, but due to potentially inclement weather, that one's going to be postponed until tomorrow. So tomorrow's game will be a double header before the championship, and the winner of the Staples Trinity game will go on to play Wilton at 7 p.m. Also in baseball news in the state, the Gatorade State SEAC Player of the Year is Jimmy Titus. He's a junior up at East Catholic, and he is committed to be playing at Bryant University in two years. Uh, Over in softball news, there is a FCAC final that is currently scheduled to be played at 5 p.m. today, but depending on the weather, that may be We're keeping an eye on that. We talked to Dave Rudin earlier this morning, and he said after talking to some of the athletic directors around the county, he still has no real word on uh, whether that one will be canceled. So as of now, it will still be on, and that game will be between the defending championships St. Joseph's and Stamford. That one will be played at Sacred Heart University in Fairfield, and both of those games coming or excuse me, and that final game coming as the result of the two semifinals in which Stamford kind of shocked Darien. Darien was looking forward to heading back to the FCAC finals, potentially avenging their loss against St. Joe's last year. Stamford took that one 4-2, to two, and St. Joseph's absolutely blew West Hill out of the water, winning 12-1. to one. So it's looking like St. Joe's will be the champion in that game, but really nothing's for sure, especially as Stamford has been stringing together some surprising wins late in the season. Heading over to lacrosse now, it's the SEAC State Boys Lacrosse Tourney, and the brackets were released today. Looking at the Class L tournament, Simsbury took the number one seed, Glastonbury the second, and Darien the third seed. And then also in Fairfield County, Greenwich has the number five seed in that one. Then in Class M for the boys, New Canaan took the second seed behind number one, North Haven. And all of the finals for boys lacrosse are at Brian McMahon High School at June 13th. The FCAC lacrosse finals are tonight at McMahon, and that one will be between Darien and Ridgefield. Those are the only two teams in Fairfield County that are nationally ranked. Darien is 16th in the country. Ridgefield is 25th. Fairfield County is a hotbed for lacrosse, as with the rest of the state of Connecticut, and I have a feeling it will continue to be. A lot of seniors on both of those teams, even juniors and some sophomores, have already committed to play at high-caliber Division I schools and in their lacrosse programs. Looking at the girls' lacrosse tourney, the SEAC brackets were also released today. Looking at Class L, the top seeds are Glastonbury, Conard, and Darien in that order. And uh, talking about some other local teams in the tournament, Ridgefield and Wilton are going to be squaring off in the 8-9 matchup, and Staples and Fairfield are, Staples and Fairfield Ward are playing each other in the 6-11 game, and those teams are 6-11, and respectively. In some other sports news, the boys' tennis finals are tonight, pending... The weather, of course, that'll be number one Staples versus the three-seed Greenwich at 4 p.m. up at Wilton High School. And just checking on some results from two days ago, it was Staples who bought their ticket there 
beating Ludlow 4 to nothing. Greenwich also swept. They beat New Canaan 4 to nothing to clinch their spots in the FCAC tennis final. Looking at the boys' volleyball finals also tonight, that'll be Darien versus Ridgefield. That one played up at Ludlow High School in Fairfield. Darien with the shocking victory over Staples last night. They were down two sets early on, and they won three straight to take the 3-2 to two win in five sets. And last but not least, we'll take a look at track and field. The championships were last night in Danbury, and Danbury got the boys' title. Richfield came in second, Staples came in third, and then on the girls' side of things, Staples won the title, narrowly edging out their rival Danbury, who came in second. That's all we got for sports today, John. All right. Thanks, Alex. We will talk to you later on. Time for our quick look at history. On this date, May 28th in 1588, the Spanish Armada, with 130 ships and 30,000 men, set sail from Lisbon, Portugal, heading for the English Channel. The Armada's goal was to overthrow the Protestant Tudor dynasty and force England back to Catholicism. But the ships, heavily loaded with an invasion force, were sitting ducks for severe weather and the English fleet, led by Sir Francis Drake, which harassed the Armada until it returned to Spain, having lost 45 of those 130 ships. In 1754, the Virginia militia, under the command of 22-year-old Lieutenant Colonel George Washington, ambushed a French reconnaissance party in the Battle of Zuman v. Glen in what is now Fayette County, in southwestern Pennsylvania, the colonial force had been sent to present sent to protect a force under construction at the location of present day Pittsburgh. A larger Canadian force had been driven off had driven off the small construction crew and sent Joseph Coulon de Villiers de Zumanville to warn Washington about encroaching French claimed territory. Fascinating. I love the early colonial stuff. Yeah, very cool. I, I love your pronunciations, I, that's, too. I, I, love, I love, I could hear you speak French all day, John. <laughs> I bet you could, Josh. 1937, uh. Volkswagen, the German automobile manufacturer, was founded. Ferdinand Porsche, well-known designer for high-end vehicles and race cars, had been trying for years to get a manufacturer interested in a small car suitable for a family or somebody like Kate. He built a car called the Volksauto, using many ideas floating around at the time, the car featured an air-cooled rear engine, torsion bar suspension, and beetle shape. The front hood rounded for better aerodynamics. And in 1999, in Milan, Italy, after 22 years of restoration, Leonardo da Vinci's masterpiece, The Last Supper, is put back on display. The work removed centuries of dirt and lamp smoke and undid the damage caused by 17th and 19th century restoration efforts. That's May 28th in history, courtesy of Donald Lang. I'm just a voice behind it. <laughs> Welcome back to Coffee. And what a voice. Yeah. <laughs> Take all the romance out of romance languages. <laughs> just teasing you. <laughs> all right, I'm moving on. Okay, back to some news. It's an active time of year for wildlife in Connecticut, and that can lead to some encounters and potential dangers for pets. According to Trumbull's animal control officer, Lynn Della Bianca, last week a resident in Trumbull who lives close to the Shelton line there let three smaller breed dogs out at night, and one of those dogs was attacked and killed. Ugh. It's not an uncommon story this time of year. We hear it in a lot of our towns, but the animal control officer in Trumbull is just warning pet owners to be more vigilant. In the last week, another report on social media said, a Labrador was actually attacked by coyotes, which Trumbull's animal control officer said is uncommon for them to go for the bigger dogs, but if they're hungry enough or there's a group of them, they might attack a larger dog like a lab. Uh, she said not letting dogs go out unsupervised is key. Coyotes are so common right now in the area and can live in any small wooded space. Even if you don't see them around, she said, rest assured they are there. The best way to discourage coyotes from becoming too comfortable or used to your neighborhood is to remove all potential food sources like dog food or brush piles that may attract small vermin. And she said if you see coyotes in your neighborhood or close to your property, she recommends hazing them, which she described as basically make noise, throw something, and let them know I'm not friendly and I don't want you around here. She said that will push them back into the woods. The problem is for people when they lose that fear. So you don't want them to. So got to haze them. Yes. Yeah, walk around campus carrying a cinder block. <laughs> that what we're talking about? I know, about? it's what I pictured, oh, too. <laughs> yeah, you want to be a coyote, huh? <laughs> Here's what you got to do. Uh, 
Uh, but that's that, John. What else is going on? Uh, this Justin Ken Dixon reporting this for the Connecticut Post. Uh, the legislature's in the waning days of its session. As usual, everything's piled up, so now they're having all-nighters trying to settle these bills. And this affects the building that we're in right now. Shortly after 11 last night, the state house approved legislation that would exempt the bluefish from the 10% admission taxes, those being waived from July 1st of this year through June 30th of 2017. These tax-free benefits already exist for admission into the Excel Center in Hartford and the Webster Bank Arena right next door to us. The vote was 119 to 23. Now the bill goes to the Senate. So we give people a little break on ticket prices, 10% break. I know that the promoters and arena owners would have uh, pushed for that. All right. Well, in other statewide news, Governor Daniel P. Malloy announced Tuesday that he has signed into law a bill aimed at speeding up the process for couples seeking an amicable divorce. The law goes into effect October 1st and requires that qualifying couples be childless, have less than $35,000 in assets, and have been married for fewer than eight years. Proponents say it could expedite the current 90-day dissolution period. During the fiscal year ending June 30th, 2014, 12,717 marriages were were dissolved in the state. The legislation was introduced by Judge Elizabeth Bazzuto, Chief Administrative Judge for Family Matters in the Judicial Branch, which told lawmakers in March that it's easier to get married than divorced in the state. Coffee break time is 1140. Staying in Hartford, a bill proposed by Fairfield State Representatives Brenda Kupchik, a Republican, and Krista mccarthy Vehi, a Democrat, seeking to establish a state task force to discuss Gus, life-threatening food allergies in schools, has passed the House of Representatives. An act concerning a task force to study life-threatening food allergies in school, a creative title there, would create a group that would disseminate best practices on food allergies and strengthening food allergy policies in schools throughout the state. The Connecticut Department of Transportation, or ed of Transportation, of Education, has guidelines for districts in the development of district-wide management plans for students with life-threatening allergies and glyc glycogen storage disease. However, the implementation of these food allergy policies varies by district. Kupchik thanked Fairfield residents Patricia Donovan and Jessica Curran for their efforts to work with Fairfield's policy committee on this issue and who testified in support of the bill. Republican State Representative Laura Devlin, whose district includes parts of Fairfield and Trumbull, also voted to support the bill, which now heads to the state Senate. All right. Thanks, John. Well, our friends over at the Bridgeport Rescue Mission have received a $10,000 grant from the Rotary Club of Bridgeport. The grant will pay for a complete kitchen makeover, including an improved layout, new flooring, commercial grade gas oven, dishwasher, gas fryer, a reach and refrigerator, countertop mixer, and a new sink and scale to weigh food donations. Executive Director Terry Wilcox, who recently visited Coffee Break, said that each month the mission provides 12,000 meals to men, women, and children who might otherwise go without. And it has been 18 years since the kitchen has been updated. Uh, so just some great, great news there, John. We're getting about to time where we got to look at the uh, newspapers. Yeah, we do. We do. We are getting there. So you want me to do a little traffic and little uh, traffic, weather, yeah. and then we'll uh, take a look at uh, what's in all of our newspapers, which are hitting the mailboxes and newsstands today. On the roads, you still have that road work in Greenwich. You still have that road work in Derby. The temperature is going up before it nosedives. And it is going to, supposed to drop from a high of near 80 down to just below 60 degrees this afternoon. It's supposed to really drop. That is why the game that we're here to cover has been postponed, as we've said multiple times. 79 the high today, 59 the low overnight. Friday, sunny, get the games in, 77 degrees. Currently 68 in Bridgeport, 68 in Fairfield, 68 in Stratford. Thanks, John. Well, when we come back, we're going to look at some of our front pages, promo some of the shows we have coming up today, and maybe we'll get to some more news as well. So that's coming up after uh, this. Uh, In the heart of picturesque downtown Ridgefield at 13 Governor Street, 
Colby's is the area's premier retailer for blinds, shades, shutters, and draperies, and is one of the select few Hunter Douglas Gallery dealers. A family-owned and operated company, Colby's experienced staff will work with you in choosing the best treatments for your home or office and offer free measuring with and expert installation. Colby's also carries an extensive line of decorative fabrics including Schumacher, Durley, Tebow, and more. Or browse over 400 books in our wallpaper library from famous designers such as Stroheim, Schumacher, Ralph Lauren, Tebow, and York. Take advantage of our Fashion in Motion Savings event with savings and rebates on Hunter Douglas Shades with Power Rise Technology. Colby's of Ridgefield, we are committed to your complete satisfaction. 203-438-8531. You're listening to Hersam Acorn Radio. 11.45 on your coffee break on HANradio.com and live streaming at HANradio.com slash live stream. We are here at the ballpark at Harbor Yard. John, it's not a bad, bad place to work today, I got to say. There's a little bit of excitement every time you go to the ballpark, even when you're going to work. Right. At least for me. Yeah. Because I love the ballpark. Yeah, and now we're looking at some of the front page of front pages of the Hersam Acorn newspapers that are on newsstands today. John, what are you seeing? Well, the story we've been following with Melvin Mason, editor of the Stratford Star, the opposition and the suit seeking to block the sale of the water pollution control plant there in Stratford. And a judge will hear that case and decide on June 2nd if there should be a referendum. They had a petition, 6,000 people, I believe it was, calling for a referendum. Mm. And they were told by town officials, no, we can't accept this under the law. Well, they're challenging that in court, hoping that the courts rule that they get their say at the polls. Also, some great shots Melvin took of the Memorial Day parade, and you'll see that on a yes, number of our papers. Yes, on all of our front pages, I would say, have some uh, great Memorial Day photos this week. Uh, I'm taking a look at the Darien Times. Um, something that we've talked a lot about in the past, which is special education in Darien, there is um, a lead story this week on a restructuring that's happening uh, with Darien Special Ed. Goals include better communication and more accountability. Uh, Aaron Marsh uh, wrote that story. So I'm going to be taking a look at that. That's very interesting. I mean, we've talked a lot about it for all the problems that, you know, popped up last year that Dave DeRoche covered. Yeah, that, that's been a story that just keeps going on and yes. on and on. Uh, also, a story that I think is going to be making headlines is one we broke not long ago. Don Ang has it on the front page of the Monroe Courier, and that is the PTO treasurer who stole money from the parent-teacher organization at uh, Stepney Elementary School. He also has a photo of this truck crash yesterday in Monroe, uh, three people sent to the hospital, and Route 25 was closed, closed for hours. basically eight hours. They yes. finally reopened it. I think it was pushing 5 o'clock, yes. and this accident happened around 8 o'clock right. in the morning. Right. All of it was closed, and then they finally opened one lane at one point, and then, yeah, the rest of it wasn't open until around 5 o'clock. Uh, looking at the New Canaan Advertiser as well, great photos from their Memorial Day ceremony, uh, and P&Z okays the post office there. I know that's been a big story. Always has been. Yeah. I've been covering post office stories in New Canaan for years. And, of course, Michael Catarivas continuing to cover um, this pol uh, police sergeant's commission, uh, police commission hearing on his potential termination. So there's a lot more on that this week. There's been a lot of development going on in Milford, and the Milford Mirror lead stories are about opposition to two proposed developments. One, a 180-unit apartment complex on Wheeler's Farm Road there. Another, about neighbors being irate about a development. Also an interesting story, Phil Donahue had uh, kept birds, and they are now being cared for by oh. Connecticut Audubon in wow. Milford. That's kind of interesting. Okay, looking at the Weston Forum, Brian Hayfley took some great photos. In fact, there's one of a bulldog decked out for Memorial Day, which is pretty adorable, but also a, a great dog story. Uh, so the selectman in Weston passed a controversial dog ordinance, but not before throwing pet owners a few bones. Nice, Kim. <laughs> I like that lead. Uh, so that ordinance has to do with pets not being allowed on uh, town parks and properties. So very interesting there 
cool read. Great job by everyone at the Weston Forum. Great story leading the Reading pilot. Um, guys who get into volunteering and fire and ambulance services often stay with it for a long time. Well, Larry Ford was a volunteer firefighter in Reading. Um, the longest serving, actually. He died last week, just a week before his 94th birthday. He had served 75 years as wow. a firefighter in, in Reading, and they honored his service on Memorial Day. Uh, just astonishing, and I'm stealing that word from the subhead there, to, to give that much of your life That's incredible. to your community. Unbelievable. Well, great story there. And looking at the Wilton Bulletin, uh, interesting. Pat Sesto, who is the director of environmental affairs there, she's leaving after 23 years. I mean, it she's just been in Wilton for so long, been such a big part of their conservation work and efforts. Uh, so there's a really nice feature that Chris Burns wrote on that. Going to Greenwich. Yes, right. So I'm sure that's a big loss for Wilton, though. I'm sure they'll miss her. She's done a lot there. We have a farmer's market coming to Ridgefield. And that will open next Thursday, June 4th, on the grounds outside Lounsbury House. That's the community center. Uh, it'll be 2 to 6 p.m. next Thursday. Also, the concerts in the park. Chirp, yes, Chirp, the Chirp concerts. Are starting again. You can find a schedule at the Ridgefield Press website or in this week's issue. All right. Well, I have to mention my paper. I times. left it for you. <laughs> well, as we mentioned earlier, one of the lead stories is about the coyote attacks happening around town and also Trumbull Day's new date and location. Trumbull Day, usually held in June, popular event, fireworks right before July 4th holiday. Uh, it's now going to be in September, according to First Selectman Tim Herbst. And there's been some backlash to that. Uh, not a lot of people have been big fans of that plan. Um but, you know, we'll see what happens. It happens to be the same weekend as the Trumbull Arts Festival, which is very popular is that regionally. Is good or bad? We have yet to see. Some people are worried it might hurt the event. And, and you know, a lot of people want to make clear the Arts Festival is its own event. It's not connected to a carnival. It's going to be in a different spot. It's on the Town Hall Green. Um, so we'll see what happens with that, you know. And you also got to think, you know, did it get moved because September is just a little bit closer to the municipal election? <laughs> Better chance to... Uh, Maybe mm. get around and, and see the folks of Trumbull. I don't know. Mm. But maybe uh, we're just being cynical. Mm. <laughs> Who knows? And, and, you know, maybe it is a, an idea to have one weekend showcase Trumbull. Yeah. I, I don't know. It could know. Be, end up being that a could great be a, idea. It could be. We, you, you don't know until right. it happens. They said, well, for instance, I did talk to Tim Herb's chief of staff, and she said in 2013 attendance was about 11000 because they charge a $5 admission fee. Last year it was Five thousand, so that is a huge difference. So maybe they're trying to find the magic date that leads to something better than that. Taking a look at the arts and leisure section, it's time to think about summer reading. You have some local authors here with an offering, and these are uh, Lee Brown and Victoria Corliss have written the Pie Sisters. It's set in Lake Canandaigua. Can I can never. It's, uh, it's set in the Finger Lakes. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> Rob Adams will correct me later on on that, um, but it's a family with uh, one of the writers with, the, with new Canaan ties. So there, if you're looking for some ideas on summer reading, check out our arts and leisure section. All right, uh, and the Shelton Herald. Legislators criticizing state spending. No surprise there. Wow, well, shock. <laughs> and Didn't then, see uh, that coming. The city is also seeking reimbursement for the sprinkler system at Shelton High School. Um, I just feel like that sprinkler system has been a big topic of discussion in the past. Um, the the alarm system the as alar well. The whole yes. The whole um, the fire safety at the high school has been a big issue in the past. A lot of people saying, you know, it was unsafe and, you know, the fire marshal passed it when he shouldn't have and all these things. So that's, that's always been on, a yeah. big story there. Um, and I'm sure that, you know, Brad Durrell now has that big news of the a little annoying when it comes on a Wednesday, that big news after the paper comes out that the superintendent yeah. is deciding to resign. But, yeah. Well, that's about it, John, for a look at our front pages. That is. <laughs> and and there is a lot. We've got some uh, after uh, – uh, maybe it's uh, this uh, just from the Lewis Bro Ledger, and that is about an uh, above-ground oil tank that caused a leak into Lake Wakabuck. 
Ooh. And a South Salem couple pleaded guilty to a wetlands violation. Uh, less than a gallon of oil leaked, but the fine, $3,500 per day for each day they did not fix the leak. Wow. So what else is new? Well, neighbors near the Oakdale Theater in Wallingford, John, are complaining about the noise caused by some of the concerts there. The town zoning enforcement officer issued a cease and desist order to the Oakdale for three violations. Oakdale officials appealed the decision before the planning and zoning department Wednesday night, but the appeals board forced the theater to close its doors because of the violations. The code enforcement officer testified that the building was supposed to be soundproof, but after numerous complaints, the town came out and tested the noise themselves. They set up tri pods with microphones on them and put them in a front lawn of a neighbor. Uh, then they came out to watch the test firsthand and the needles on the meter were jumping. The Oakdale Theater says it will continue to fight the charges and work with neighbors to keep the sound inside the building. An online petition has more than 10,000 signatures to save the iconic theater. Uh, Andrea Case says she signed it because to shut it down would be to lose a part of Wallingford's history. While the theater is forced to go dark for now, there will be a meeting June 8th for the Oakdale to show how they've fixed the problems. I can't imagine Connecticut without the Oakdale. No, me either. It's been so Do we long. still call I mean they're still calling it the Oakdale now? I mean for a while it yeah, was had a terrible sponsor name, but the Oakdale's just great. Once the problem started, it became the Oakdale again. Yeah, exactly. That, that, that's how that works. <laughs> uh, there's also some news out of Ridgefield, John. If you remember that fatal fire that we reported on recently. Oh, yes. It's been more than a month since that fire, which was April 23rd, and that swept through 15 Cook Close, which is in the Casagmo condominium complex, fat fatally injuring an elderly woman who died three days later. The investigation that followed the blaze has come and gone, but the results of that investigation remain distant, depending on the workload of the state police crime investigation lab, according to Fire Marshal David Lathrop. The fire was contained to one unit of the building at Cook Close, the average turnaround time on a fire investigation is 42 days, according to Dr. Guy Valero, director of the Department of Emergency Services and Public Protection Division of Scientific Services based in Meriden. It is the so-called forensics lab where samples from crime scenes, including murders and fires, are sent. He said he is currently working on April cases with a backlog of nine cases for the month. Uh, he said over the last two years, they have averaged 100 cases a year in the arson lab. The current goal for the entire lab is results in less than 30 days. Uh, so there's a lot more on that story. Very interesting just about them trying to get those results on that fatal Ridgefield fire and you can find more about that at the ridgefieldpress.com. And I just saw news move on WMPR that's going to shut me up. Oh. Believe it or not. Yes. The House of Representatives, the Connecticut House of Representatives voted last night 110 to 33 in favor of a bill requiring public schools to add instruction in cardiopulmonary resuscitation to middle or high school health and safety curriculum. The instruction must be based on the American Heart Association guidelines for CPR. It was pushed by an East Lyme state senator who told lawmakers, and this is a, a huge fear of, of mine here, that his wife died of a massive heart attack in 2009, and he tried to do CPR and realized he had no idea wow. how to do it properly. So it's already passed the Senate. So now it's in the hands of Governor Malloy to sign this bill that would require high school or middle school students to learn CPR in health classes, and I think it's a great move. All right. Well, John, uh, anything change out on the roads before we head out? Uh, do, uh, weather, we have a big change just come in, and we now have a severe thunderstorm watch that went into effect just a couple minutes ago and is in effect now until 7 p.m. This is a severe thunderstorm watch means conditions are suitable for formation, but we don't have any evidence of them yet. Take a quick look at the roads here. Just give me a second. Well, we hope that storm won't affect Yankee Fisherman, which is coming up. That I've <laughs> been thinking about that. Uh, <laughs> nothing really new on the roads. The road work that we've been reporting in Greenwich on the Merritt Parkway South and in Derby on Route 8. All right. Well, 
coming up right after us, audio only at hanradio.com or all of our news websites, is Patty Gay's Stir Crazy Food Chat Show. Today, they're going to be talking about barbecue and grilling. Guests are Chris Sexton of Hoodoo Brown, a new barbecue restaurant in Ridgefield, and also our coworkers, Mario and Vanessa Recupito, will share their grilling tips and their recipes, John. And then I'll have Yankee Fisherman live from the ballpark at Harbor Yard after that. Great. Well, have a great afternoon, everyone. Person Acorn and HANradio.com. The leader in local news, sports, arts, and entertainment in southwestern Connecticut.